Hi, this is Priyanka Chopra and you are watching Channel Y. The biggest South Asian media group, Y Media. Y Media. Y media group established in 2001 is a media company with a 360 degree approach in reaching our audience over five platforms television radio newspaper online news portal and mobile app why media has newspaper midweek radio South Asian Pulse. Hi, I'm Amitabh Bachchan and you're listening to South Asian Pulse. Hi, this is Amir Khan and you're listening to South Asian Pulse. All English 24 7 television network and Y Media Plus. You are watching Channel Y. Channel Y. Prime Minister, welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to be back. Y Media is the official media partner for TIFF 2022. It's so exciting to be here. Exclusive show all about the Toronto International Auto Show. So Cam's going to tell us more about uh, the amazing vehicle behind us right now. You can see the Devel 16. Hi, I'm Ria Khan, and on behalf of Y Media, welcome to Channel Y. One Y Media Group welcomes you to Channel Y once again. Channel Y ke entertainment special sure. made jahan SouthAsianDaily.com, the biggest South Asian media group. Why media? Team lead karta hai. Sati jadi Why media di jadi guideline hai. Number one, Why media di guideline. Number ek the cheese hai ki accuracy. Number two the fairness. Third public relations. So ye ye three guidelines hai si kam kar. Hello everyone, my name is Yudhvir Jaswal, I am the group editor at Y Media and today we are going to discuss at Y Media Political Sensex, it's going to be Ford versus Crombie. Yes, I'm sure you're well aware of the breaking news. Bonnie Crombie, she has won the Liberal leadership race right here in Ontario. We're going to discuss how it panned out and what does the future hold for us. So we have two very special guests, uh, we'd like to welcome Nikki Kaur. Uh, Nikki, a very warm welcome on Y Media, how are you? You're very welcome, Nikki Ji, and I'm sure everyone is aware Nikki Kaurji, she ran for a very good campaign as far as the Brampton Mirror election, and she's a lawyer by profession. Definitely, she's going to offer us many insights. What's, what are we expecting here in Ontario? We also have another lawyer on the panel today, Harminder Ji with us. Harminder Ji, very warm welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, you were there at the Liberal Leadership today at the Toronto Congress Centre. I'm sure you'll offer us more insights. But before we do that, once again, the big breaking news uh, Bonnie Crombie, she has won the Ontario Liberal leadership race. So uh, I, I know uh, Bonnie uh, from quite some time. I still remember the time when she was uh, actively engaging herself in politics. Uh, Michael Ignatieff, the Liberal leadership race, she engaged her quite well in that. Then 2008, Stephen Dion actually went on to become the leader. She became uh, in 2008 the member of parliament from Mississauga Streetsville. Uh, after that, uh, 2011 elections, um, there was a conservative wave and then almost all the stalwarts from Liberal Party, they lost and yes, uh, Bonnie also lost. But in 2011 itself, uh, there was a very interesting race uh, in Ward number 5. I remember Eve Adams moving on to the federal level, she won the elections. 
but then she had that wicked seed. There were so many names there. I could see, uh, you know, Eve Adams' ex-husband Peter, he was there. Carolyn Parrish was there. Bonnie Crombie was there. Jake Thier was there. Uh, in our community, I remember Kurinder Bobby Dade. That's the first time I met her. She was there. Simmercore was there. You, you name it. I was, it was a very crowded race, uh, Ward number 5 and Bonnie. She won that in 2011. And then 2014, Hazel McCallion, she stepped down and there was, uh, I think after a while, I was watching uh, a very hotly contested mirror race so that was in 2014. And 2014, uh, when Steve Mahoney, he was definitely the front runner. I mean, we could see all the poll numbers, but then came the twist in the story, the whole dynamics changed when uh, Hazel McCallion, she endorsed uh, Bonnie Crombie. I, I remember actually Hazel endorsed her in 2011 uh, council elections as well. Up until that time, I know there were many who, uh, including Carolyn Parrish, Jake Thier, and many who would say, no, she's endorsing us. But then the news came out. Uh, Hazel, she endorsed her in 2011 for councillor and here the, at the mayoral election as well. And after that, uh, she won the mayoral election. So here we are today from uh, this is the third time and uh, I heard the other day she was saying that she's not going to contest again in 2026 even if she loses but no she has won so she said uh, I would contest for MPP. When is she going to leave the middle position? She's still still going to keep her day job there. Uh, what I heard from today and uh, I interview, interviewed her the other day as well and she was telling most likely by January somewhere around the early next year so she wants I'm sure she would want to do certain things. So let me come to you, uh, Nikiji, straight away. What do you think? Uh, what's your take on this whole scenario now? Please, Ford versus Crombie. Ford versus Crombie. Yeah. First of all, big, big, big congratulations to Mayor Karambi. She, I personally think, is well-deserved. She has done an amazing job with Mississauga. When I look at Mississauga from a stark difference from the rest of municipalities, the neighboring city of Brampton, where I'm from, they have hospitals, LRT, Walls. Anything you see is just beautiful. So I have a feeling that she's going to do justice to Ontario, to every single city. She's going to make it like Mississauga or even better. Okay. Arvindraji, you were there. Uh, I would want you to uh, tell our viewers, you know, uh, how, were, how did things pan out there? Were the supporters excited? I'm sure there were some heartbreaks for sure uh, yes. for other candidates, but I want you to explain. Yes, yes, I was there all day today and uh, for full disclosure, I was supporting uh, the number two candidate, Askin Smith. Okay. So I spent past six, seven months working for him and now Crombie is the uh, leader of the Ontario Liberal Party. And um, you probably noticed uh, he was expecting to win on the first ballot. Yeah. Didn't happen. Then they were expecting on the second ballot, didn't happen. So it went right down to the wire and uh, she won on the third ballot. And just for viewers, I can give the numbers. Um, on the first ballot, uh, Crombie got uh, 55, 59 uh, points. These are all points, all votes. And then the second one was Nate, he got 33 and 20 votes. And then on the second ballot, when the third uh, Ted Sue dropped out, uh, Crombie's numbers went to 6047, and uh, Nate's numbers went to 3792. And obviously, nobody got 50% yet. On the final third ballot, uh, Crombie got 6911, almost 7000, and uh, Nate got uh, 6029. So it was a very close race, uh, and in the final, she ended up winning, I think, approximately 54%, and Nate got 46%. So it was not a, um, it was not a something you can say by a huge margin, but it was a convincing victory. Right? Yeah, uh, you're right. Um and she was very confident early, earlier on as well. I mean, when we interviewed her, she says she thought she's going to win. There isn't any chance for anyone else. And you're right, uh, most of the people thought that she's going to win, but uh, not on. she thought that she's going to win on the first battle. Uh, so before I go back to Nikiji, where did it go wrong? I mean, they were expecting a, a I, Yes, yes. I think uh, Crombie made a few mistakes early on, if you okay. remember, okay. when she declared her candidacy and uh, she said, uh, the previous liberal governments, they were a little bit too far to the left and uh, they were spending too much money on uh, education and health and uh, that didn't go well with the big uh, uh, voter support inside the Liberal Party uh, because the Liberal Party, many in the Liberal Party view those things as their achievements. Having a tuition university 
tuition free for certain income parents and um, health care the premium there used to be a premium that uh, people used to pay and Dalton cut that off so I think those were the two missteps that sort of haunted her even though she tried to correct um, as she went along and had a new policy for, for the pretty for the progressive policies but I think those were the two uh, missteps her campaign team took in early on with hurt them quite a bit. And I think they campaigned quite hard, even though Mayor Karambi has a lot of name recognition. And the second candidate is a sitting M MP, if I'm correct. Yeah. So so it's it's equal caliber to, to some degree. And, and I just think it's more about you've got further in the, some of the smaller municipalities, they carry more of a weight as far as the numbers are concerned, not the votes, but the, the numbers that come down to make up the votes. And, and I, from what I know, her team was reaching far in northern parts of Ontario and southern parts of Ontario, and it started on very early. Right, and we will definitely take a few calls as well, but before we get on to the calls, I'll come back to you once again. Uh, we've heard, uh, you know, almost uh, 103,000 uh, people signed up, but the votes were, you could correct me if wrong, you were there, but I, uh, I think I have my numbers correct. It's less than 23,000 people came out to vote. Why is this so much of a difference? I mean, if there are 100,000, I know it's free, uh, the Liberals this time, they're not charging anything, so you could become a Liberal member. But uh, 103,000, I thought the number could go higher. Uh, what could be the possible reason for that? One of the biggest things I'm using, even in the federal election, even in the municipal election, is people are just not interested in voting. They're just so busy in their day-to-day -day life, they're not aware of it. And, and that's what I'm noticing, especially with um, federal election I think it was probably one of the lowest turnouts the last federal election we had and along with the municipal election it was the same thing so it, it's it's almost as if if you're in the know if you know that there is something going on you will go out to vote or others are just not interested because of some people are so busy everyday activities work and and I think it's just the the times of the economy right now people are so busy trying to figure out what to do next and, and some of them are just not interesting. Okay, and what's your take on this? Yes, actually, I'm um, looking at quite a bit of it. Um, if you look at the last municipal election in, uh, in Mississauga, mm -hmm. uh, it was roughly around 22%. And Mississauga is near the bottom in the province. Um, I think there are a few other factors. Uh, uh, also, this was an election where you had to go to a polling station on one given day for four hours. Okay, it's quite constraining. Um, I know many people who were registered to vote, but at the last moment they had to go out of town for some family reason, for employment reasons. And in uh, uh, Mississauga and Brampton, it's a trucking hub. Right. The truck drivers have no control over their schedule. Sometimes they are coming into town and their trucks get delayed for whatever reason, or they get called in and they leave early. So I think you know, the fact that the Liberal Party did not have any other option, uh, regarding mail-in ballots or uh, e-votes. I think that hurt the turnover. Uh, turnover. Um, but also, as Nikki said, people usually do not take much interest in uh, uh, leadership campaigns or municipal elections. Most of the time we see in Canada, uh, our democracy is sort of a little bit of, uh, old dated and um, people take interest mostly in the national and uh, provincial elections. You know, an Ontario NDP leadership race, there weren't many candidates, though they, uh, it was only Barrett Styles at that time. And this time also, there it wasn't a very crowded race. I mean, you would have more people running for a councillor, I was just discussing earlier, than in the leadership race. There were five, then one dropped out in favour of Bonnie, and then you just had four candidates. So do you think, not only at the municipal level, but at federal level, but even at the provincial level, I think so, not many people want to throw their hat in the ring. Is, is that the case? It's, it's a very difficult thing to do, to put your name out there and have the ability and the resources because it takes a lot of time and it's a 24-hour job. As we were just talking earlier, you have to keep going again and again and again and never give up. And you have to be the jack of all trades, which is the biggest. It, you have to be, you have to wear the hat of jack of all trades. You have to know the answers to every question. And people have a really short patience a span. They need to know the answer now and if you don't do something for them they will go the other way. So it's extremely important to be competent and who has that longevity to actually go through the race. It takes a lot to put your name forward I think. That's one of the reasons maybe there were more people. 
Do you think uh, Arvindri we are getting competent people coming uh, into the political arena? Actually, um, I think that's one of my passions to um, discuss the democracy, why the people vote or why the people do not vote or uh, run for leadership. Um, I think uh, Nikki did um, hit the nail on the head. Uh, it's a very thankless job and uh, people assume from the get-go that uh, people are in politics because they are bad people. Um, that's a huge stigma and a lot of decent people, reasonable people, people who are very successful lawyers or accountants, they don't want to go in there, that's one thing. And I think the, the bit of the blame also lies with the system we have. And as I said in the earlier segment, uh, um, the system doesn't encourage, encourage the engagement. In this day and age, why don't we have electronic e work You can apply for mortgage, you can apply for visa to travel to different countries online. And why do we have to uh, cast our ballot only within four hours on a certain day at a certain place? Why that thing has not changed in the last 150 years since Canada came into being? So I think we have to address it on multiple fronts. Um, people do not engage because they lack avenues, uh, especially at the municipal level. We don't have the political parties. So people have difficulty in finding out who is running and what's that a candidate's platform. So uh, I think we need a very sort of structural uh, democratic reform at all levels uh, that people will uh, be more excited to engage and they are, because the engagement is more excessive. Yeah, but then uh, you were mentioning about the democracy earlier and, and I do understand the challenges as uh, Nikki was mentioning that to put your name on the ballot, run and even if you get elected, then uh, you mentioned the word uh, thankless job. Uh, we call, in, in cricketing terms, we call wicket keeping as one of the most thankless uh, jobs. But but still, wicket keeper d get some credit. I am sure the politicians do get some sort of credit if if they, they, they do good things. But I'm concerned because this is the only way you can make the lives of people better. Of course, we do our part uh, as a fourth pillar of democracy, media. But we don't have that many powers. Uh, the laws are only made in the parliament or so to speak here in this case, Queen's Park or at the city hall. We don't get to change anything that effectively. So if you're not bringing in competent people, there is how would we make sure the lives of people are getting better? And and look where here we are today. I mean, if I ask in Canada, are we? And and I want to hear your opinion too, as much as we're discussing a very interesting thing. But but let me hear your opinion too. In Canada, I mean, what's on the ups, upside? Healthcare, education, crime, infrastructure, uh, economy, jobs, inflation. There are challenges all over. We need competent people to get elected. Nikki, your take. Thank you. Great question. I've been waiting for this one. So one of the biggest things is when you talk about competent people, somebody has to take leadership as community service. It at the end of the day, as my partner has just said, it's a thankless job. It really is. You have to be the jack of all trades. At the same time, you have to be prepared to get a no, we're not satisfied with everything we do or anything we do. The reality is if you, I'm from Brampton, my business is in Brampton, born, brought up everything, whole entire life have been in the city. And I love it to the passion. If I look at the infrastructure, we have zero to show for it. If I look at Mississauga, they are going to be getting Ontario's largest hospital, $3 billion. But what do we have in Brampton? We don't even have one fully functioning. We're the joke of hallway medicine. Why is it? Leadership, lack of leadership, complete lack of leadership. And I've always said it, and I say it again today, and I'll say it again tomorrow. It's lack of competent leadership or leadership that wants to take ownership or wants to do the service to its people. The people pay the taxes. They pay all of their dues. Why is it the elected officials won't do their job? Why won't they step up to the job? And now you say we had these four candidates. And when I look at Mayor Karambi, if I look at Mississauga and Brampton, we're a day and night difference in cities, completely day and night. Sixth largest city, we're somewhere in the ninth largest city, but yet we don't have anything to show for it. Why? Lack of leadership. No competency, no transparency, and no accountability. Every single thing being used to be spun in favor of I, the I. Like recently, there's been an ad going around, I'm sure you've seen it, 35% increase when the three-tier system, regional appeal, will break apart. That's simply inaccurate. It's been released to all of media, where there is no link, no standing ground, regional appeal didn't see it, 
The Transition Committee didn't see it. Mississauga has nothing to do with it. The city of Mississauga on December the 3rd on their website released an official statement. This is a political stunt. If you're going to be lying to your people, why are you in that position? This, this is what I think. We need competent leadership at all uh, levels of the government, federal, provincial, municipal. What do we do with that if, if there is lack of interest in running itself? Yeah, I, I'll come back to the same system that we need to change the system. The people Decent people, we call them. Uh, they feel encouraged and motivated to take party, uh, participate in this one. And uh, as Nikki said, uh, Nikki way more qualified to comment about Brampton because she has a long history uh, there. But, uh, I mean, when was the one month then we didn't have a new scandal coming out of Brampton City Hall. Uh, Brampton has become a joke. People make fun all over the country, whatever goes in Brampton City Hall. So the decent people, when they see the uh, shenanigans going on, uh, at any level, in the City Hall or provincial level, uh, Greenbelt, we saw at the provincial level, the decent people who, and as you said, the only change we can bring has to come via politics. So, if we want to change, make any change in people's lives, we have to engage with the political system. But when you see uh, these scandals happening at city halls or the Greenbelt scandal, which uh, there is a criminal investigation going on now, then the decent people say, why am I going to take this pain for myself? I got my decent business, I got my law career, I got my business running. Why should I go and get involved where I'm going to acquire a bad name? So every, every bad, Every time there is a scandal, probably 10 people say, it's not for me. You mentioned Greenbelt, I want both, both of you to discuss that because I'm sure, um, I, I heard uh, Bonnie Crombie's speech today and um, it was more, I think if I had to pick one word, uh, her word was resilience today, but if I had to pick one word, it would be Ford. She mentioned Ford so many times and then even after her speech, I was listening to her on different TV channels and uh, one of the things that she kept on mentioning uh, was that, you know, uh, Ford abuse his friends, scandals, green bed, and you brought this out as well. So with Bonnie being elected and she's going to challenge uh, Premier Ford as well in 2026, but, but she also mentioned uh, in her speech today, the PCs are out, they are going to target us any minute. So I think it's, it's almost the race is on. It's Ford versus Crombie, Greenbelt scandal. Your take on this one. Thanks for that question. Uh, well, it is one of the biggest scandals. As, as we've just been told, it's still an ongoing open investigation. RCMP, as we've been informed, is still looking into it. So one of, one of the, sometimes I think, as I was speaking with you earlier, that is the delivery, the delivery of something, how you package something and how you deliver the deal. If the green belt is so much in Ontario and it's extending so further out all the way beyond 401, but we have little land for industrial use, little land for residential use, why don't we come up with a plan? Maybe the Liberals will do it, I don't know, because I haven't seen it from the Conservatives, obviously. They're going back to, um, the, well not Conservatives, I take that back, what I mean is the Ford government. They're, they're taking some steps back to correct some things that had happened. But what with, with Karambi, we could hopefully see that she could work with the community, with perhaps even, because I've stumbled upon some farmers that are part of the Greenbelt land, and they would love to get rid of their lands. They would love to retire. They would love to make some money also and have a residual income because they're frankly tired of some of the stuff they're doing. There needs to be a balance of how could we all benefit from this. The community should be the first to benefit. Some businesses should be generated. And at the same time, we have this great business community, these builders that want to do something. But how do we bring everyone together? And that should be something I think Mayor Karambi should really, once she steps into her leadership role as a liberal leader, should look into. How could we step on this and take it one notch up so we can benefit in Ontario and not just have unused areas of land that is not going to do anything? I still remember when I spoke with Bonnie earlier in our interview and she did mention, uh, even before this uh, Greenbelt scandal that uh, it, it came out in public and she was quite concerned about the Greenbelt issue, how the land deals are done. Uh, but Ramindraji, um, I'm sure you, you're part of this whole thing and you also supported one of the candidates as well. So there has been discussion from the Liberal candidates as well and Bonnie's opponents as well, that uh, she's taking the donations from 
almost very similar people from whom Ford has been taking, though she's denied all that. And also, there are questions that uh, about Greenwald, will Bonnie Crombie be offering, in case she gets elected uh, as a premier, a clean government? I, I can assure you, uh, Bonnie's um, government will be very clean, especially as we compare it to the current Ford government. Okay. Uh, as Nikki said, that uh, the Greenbelt scandal, uh, 8 billion scandal, that's the biggest scandal ever in the history of Canada. Is that not a small bar or a low bar to me? The biggest scandal ever that occurred in Canada, that amount. And the fact that the OPP handed over the investigation to RCMP, uh, that is very, very concerning. It doesn't happen very often. A sitting premier, sitting minister are under criminal investigation. Do that, but you know, just to set the things in the right perspective, uh, you're a lawyer yourself. Do you think that could be bec uh, mainly because of the conflict of interest? Because OPP, of course, it's it, it's a comes under a provincial government. So, uh, and and I read their statement that they didn't want to even the perception of any conflict of interest. So maybe OPP passed on to RCMP because of conflict of interest. That could be the reason. Please, we have no idea why they they, they never said uh, publicly why they are passing on the file from OPP to RCMP. It could be that uh, there are, uh, yeah. first of all, the one conflict, some people may not think it's a conflict, the head of the OPP is appointed by the provincial government. Yeah. So usually there are some links going back and maybe the OPP commissioner thought it's probably not appropriate because he, he owes his job to the provincial government. So that could be one conflict, but there could be multiple conflicts uh, with the people who are involved in the investigation. It could be an, any one of them. Uh, coming back to the green belt, and I just want to co comment about Nikki's uh, point. Doug Ford's government is planning to build 1.5 million homes. Doug Ford's commission said we have enough land to build 1.5 million homes outside the green belt. Not a liberal government. Doug Ford appointed own commission only a few months back. Not only that, at this level, now, different municipalities in across Ontario have already issued permits for more than 1.5 million homes. They're already in the pipeline. The builders are choosing not to build them. The city of Mississauga alone has given close to 90,000 permits which are not being built. The York region has another 90,000 90, units. So the housing thing is more complicated. But this, uh, the land has been always the biggest um, or of corruption scandals in the history of not only Ontario but anywhere else because if you have a piece of land it's not zoned properly it's worth nothing somebody changes something and the zoning law changes the same piece of land within one minute is now worth gold so that's where the corruption comes from the same thing it's the same thing that doesn't happen to your other assets but the land is the only one that if it's zoned in one way, almost what pennies, but the moment the zoning changes and only political people can change the zoning, and suddenly now it's worth millions and tens of millions of dollars. Two, two points here. First of all, these are still allegations and investigations are on, so no, no, uh, nothing has been proven in the court of the law. And I'll just further uh, add to your point, 1.5 million. Yeah, you're right. I mean, some of the reports even mentioned we could even build uh, 2 million homes outside the green belt. So, Yes, there are clear reports. There, uh, there's no shortage of land for that matter that you have to use the green belt, and this is uh, one of the biggest uh, scandals that we have ever seen uh, in in Canada. Uh, but, but what will Bonnie do about it? I mean, uh, do you think uh, uh, she will? I know Harmindri just mentioned that he's quite confident that Bonnie's government will be a very clean government. I mean, she could be doing that. Uh, but do you think? Uh, I have no reasons to doubt her integrity, let me put it this way as well, but I'm just questioning because people do not want to see any further scandals. They want to see a clean government, effective, efficient government. I think the biggest uh, positive history with Bonnie we have is the city of Mississauga, her eight years as mayor. I don't know how many scandals have come from there, but there usually isn't one every month at all, or even every year. And the level of development in the city, hospitals like I mentioned, the biggest hospital in Ontario is going to be landing there. She fought for her city fearlessly. 
to get the divorce from the region appeal, and she continued the battle regardless of the fact that it was tough, people were not taking a stance, they continued, continued, and continued. And in the end, they got what they wanted. So you have a leader that has a lot of caliber and the advocacy behind it, and she stands for her people. And I think that's what we'll expect to see if she's elected as, as the next premier. Okay. Yeah, the only one thing I could recall is maybe there was an issue regarding her election spending in 2011 when she ran as a uh, councillor. But uh, yeah, there was, there, there was withdrawn later on, so I have to put that on record as well. There was withdrawn. But other than that, I, you're right, I, I can't recall. Uh, she supported uh, Michael Ignatiev in the leadership race, then she, became, she ran as an MP. Uh, from 2008 till 2011, then as a councillor for 2011 to 2014, um, and then mayor from 2014 up until now. So yeah, I haven't uh, seen uh, anything of, of that sort, and that that's what we need. Quickly moving on to the uh, next thing now. Now what what happens next? She's been talking about uh, abuse by by the premier. She said so many different uh, things. I was just uh, listening to that. But one of the major challenges that she would be facing, and I'm sure there must be lots of discussion there. You were there at the Toronto Congress Centre today. Uh, the Liberal Party has been decimated to a single digit. Uh, I mean, you, Liberal Party doesn't even have an official party status. There are 124 seats and uh, you need at least 12 to have an official party status. Liberals haven't been able to do that uh, for two consecutive elections. So how do you get out of that? I think um, that's quite accurate, actually, uh, the Liberal Party was decimated. Um, it will be a big challenge for them. Nobody should assume it's very easy to revive the party from third status to a winning party. Um, I think Bonnie knows that. And um, to continue on Mickey's point, I think um, Bonnie's um, experience from uh, running the city of Mississauga will come very handy. Um, as you know, at city level, we have no political parties. So all the councillors and the mayor, they have to come together to make the city work. So that is a quite a good skill to have when you're building a new party. You have different people who have different ideas. You need to bring them back together and rebuild the entire party from scratch, from third party status. I think bonnies of that skill will come very handy. And uh, I'm quite confident uh, given her stature, especially she has been going go to toe with Doug Ford for, for a while, even before the election, uh, leadership uh, election was announced. So she got a name recognition uh, across Ontario, and uh, she has a personality. She's uh, standing there, she's talking in, the, in front of TV cameras. You could see that she looks like a leader, she talks like a leader. I think those things will come for the end. And we're also witnessing her, uh, uh, just for viewers' benefit, I, I would want to play a clip, any clip uh, that our technical team can play, uh, pick and choose. So let's listen what Bonnie uh, said after winning the leadership race. And I have a few points to discuss, it was uh, quite a few things that she said. But maybe I'll let uh, the, our technical team play a small clip. Let's listen what Bonnie Crombie, now uh, the Ontario Liberal Party leader, please. has really been an amazing experience. Contested campaigns, hotly contested campaigns like this one. This was a marathon, oh my goodness. And I know that many, many people in this room have worked incredibly hard for the last six months, for the last year, some for more than a year to get to here today. So thank you for every bit of effort that you have put into rebuilding our party. It is by challenging each other to be bolder, smarter, and to work harder that we will keep building the Ontario Liberal Party back. But we need your energy, we need your ideas, and we need you! Nous avons besoin de tous les libérales de l'Ontario. We need every liberal across Ontario working together. 
So I want to take a moment to thank the people who have brought this party together in such an exciting way. Nate? Yes? That was a small clip uh, what uh, Bonnie Crombie said after uh, winning the Ontario Liberal Leadership Race. And towards the end of this uh, show, we will play the entire speech that we gave. You can definitely uh, pick points from that. A uh, few things that I want to discuss. Uh, Nikki, why don't I come to you this time? Uh, she mentioned in her speech, I was listening then, she mentioned her about Ted her grandparents, about her mother. Uh, she also spoke about how they, they were separated while she was just three. Um, her father's mental health issues, her father's addiction, then how she had to struggle, um, you know, living and how so many other challenges that she faced. Uh, and before she mentioned this, I was listening to her. Uh, most of you know Bonnie Crombie. Some of you know a little about me. So, was uh, I mean, was was she trying to you know shatter the perception that uh, she she drives nice fancy cars, she goes to Hamptons in New York, or was she? But what was she trying to do there? I, I just want to understand that. Uh, we look at the mountain. And we think, wow, it's a great big mountain. She's showing you the foundation. That I come from a home where this was present, this was present, this was present, but I decided to walk. And all of these pillars made me. So you may be going through mental health, you may be going through a broken home, or you may be going through a home where there just isn't enough money for education. But here I stand, her word over there, she kept saying, I need you, together. Her message, from what I pick up, is one team, one goal. She wants to unite the liberals and everyone else, and that's what she's going to do. Her body language is open. I'm here for you, I'm open for you. It's about you. So it's not about this leader that's standing in front of you, but it's about you and let me walk for you. And that's what she's doing. She's telling you, she's coming to the level that each one of us is at, that I'm here for you. Regardless of what you may have thought, but I'm just like each one of you. That's what I pick up. A couple of calls, I, don't, I doubt we have much time to take calls today and there are a few other things I wanted to discuss. Uh, not too many calls that we can, let me squeeze in just a couple of them. Yeah, uh, hello sir, a very warm welcome on Channel Y. Hello, yes sir, you're, you're live on the air. Sasikal. Yes, I जी 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 होने दस देने सर और कोई क्वेश्चन तो आड़ा नो थैंक यू दैट्स ऑल थैंक यू सर थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू ऐसा ऐसा है कि जदो भी कोई लीडरशिप रेस होती है तो इन्हें रूल्स होंगे इस ये रूल और ज्यादातर लीडरशिप रेस रूल यही है कि मिनिमम 50% जड़े है तुसी पॉइंट्स लेने हैं 50% पॉइंट्स देते जाते हैं इस बार की सगा कि हर एक राइडिंग दे 100 पॉइंट्स ने और उस तो अलावा दस होर एसोसीएशन ने उन्होंने पॉइंट्स ने अठ वुमेन एसोसीएशन ने उन्होंने पॉइंट्स ने सो उन्होंने सारे पॉइंट्स को मिला के रफली अराउंड ट्वेल्व थाउजेंड समथिंग पॉइंट्स बनते हैं उन्होंने मिनीम फिफ्टी परसेंट पॉइंट्स जो तुम लेंगे हो फिफ्टी परसेंट पॉइंट्स तो तुम जितते हो सो जे तो फस्ट बैलट के फिफ्टी परसेंट पॉइंट्स बन जाते हैं तो जित जाते हो ऐसा उन्होंने उम्मीद सी पर ऐसा नहीं होया सो फस्ट बैलट के नहीं होया फिर वो की होंगे कि है जिस तरह पांच जने होंगे ना वन टू थ्री फोर फाइव तो जोड़े वोट करते हैं उन्होंने ये हक हों कि वो अपना पहली पिक भी दस दे कि नंबर वन साड़ी चॉइस आया उस बाद नंबर टू नंबर थ्री ऐसे ही चॉइस वो दस दे आ सो फिर की है जो आखिरी से सब तो पहला जोड़े चौथे कैंडीडेट होंगे चाहे सू बार हो गए फिर यासिर नकवी बार हो गए फिर अखीर योर कैंडीडेट वॉज वॉज स्टिल देयर हाँ जी गोहैड जी ना हो फस्ट बैलट से बॉनी ने जी मिलिया से तकरीबन वह बताली परसेंट के करीब से जी जी है तो बताली परसेंट ना जो लीडर बनता है तो तुम देखो भी जो अठवंजा परसेंट ने वो कहे सा कोई तलक ही नहीं है तो वो करके उन्होंने जो तो बैलट बनता है वो जिन्हें कैंडीडेट जिम्मे कहा कि वो मेरी पहली चॉइस दूजी तीजी चौथी है जो तो चौथी वाला बहर हो गया जो चौथी वाली वोटा ने उन्होंने बैलट के उत्ते देखा जाता है ना सैकेंड चॉइस की है वो फिर उन्होंने ट्रांसफर हो जाते बैलट जो तीजी वाला बहर हो जाता है फिर जो पहले चौथी वाले तो दूजे वाले ने उन्हों की सैकेंड तो थर्ड चॉइस देखते फिर वह बैलट दूजे चले जाते हैं जिम्मे टेडसू से टेडसू जो पहला बहर गया जिन्हें उन जिन्हों लोगों ने उन्होंने वोट पाई थी फिर उन्होंने बैलट देखे गए भी इन्होंने अपनी दूजी चॉइस किनू दी है वो भी वंड दती है टेडसू दिन तेरह सौ जो पॉइंट से उन्होंने चले गए यासर नकवी जो आ गए तीजे नंबर से रह गए 
ਤੇ ਯਾਸਰ ਨਖਵੀ ਦੀ ਜਿੰਨੇ ਲੋਕਾਂ ਨੇ ਯਾਸਰ ਨਖਵੀ ਨੂੰ ਨੰਬਰ 1 ਪਾਇਆ ਸੀ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਗਿਆ ਵੀ ਇਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਦੂਜੀ ਚੁਆਇਸ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਆ ਉਧਰ ਚੱਲੀ ਗਈ ਤੇ ਟੈਡ ਫੂ ਕਿਉਂਕਿ ਦੂਜੀ ਚੁਆਇਸ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਹੀ ਵਰਤੀ ਜਾ ਚੁੱਕੀ ਹੈ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦੀ ਦੇਖਿਆ ਜਾਂਦਾ ਤੀਜੀ ਚੁਆਇਸ ਕਿਹੜੀ ਸੀ ਉਹਨਾਂ ਦਾ ਥਰਡ ਬੈਟਲ ਬੈਲਟ ਹੋ ਗਿਆ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੱਕ ਕਿਸੇ ਨੂੰ 50% ਤੋਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਨਾ ਮਿਲ ਜਾਏ ਜਦੋਂ ਤੱਕ 50% ਪੁਆਇੰਟਸ ਤੋਂ ਜ਼ਿਆਦਾ ਨਹੀਂ ਮਿਲਣ ਉਸ ਵੇਲੇ ਤੱਕ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਇਹ ਪ੍ਰੋਸੀਜਰ ਜਿਹੜਾ ਉਹ ਚੱਲਦਾ ਰਹਿੰਦਾ ਹੈਗਾ ਸੋ ਇੱਕ ਇੱਕ ਕਰਕੇ ਉਹ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟਸ ਇਲੀਮਿਨੇਟ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਜਾਂਦੇ ਜਿਸ ਤਰ੍ਹਾਂ ਕਿ ਦੱਸਿਆ ਹੀ ਹੈ ਹਰਮਿੰਦਰ ਜੀ ਨੇ ਸੋ ਸਭ ਤੋਂ ਪਹਿਲਾਂ ਇਹਦੇ ਵਿੱਚ ਟੈਡ ਸੂ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਸੀਗੇ ਉਹ ਬਾਹਰ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਫਿਰ ਯਾਸਰ ਨਕਵੀ ਬਾਹਰ ਹੋ ਗਏ ਸੋ ਆਖਰੀ ਮੌਕੇ ਤੱਕ ਇਦਾਂ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟਸ ਬਾਹਰ ਜਿਹੜੇ ਨੇ ਹੁੰਦੇ ਰਹਿੰਦੇ ਨੇ ਜਸਟ ਫਾਰ ਵਿਊਅਰਸ ਬੈਨਿਫਿਟ ਆਈ ਲਾਈਕ ਟੂ ਟੈਲ ਯੂ ਦੈਟ ਥਿਸ ਵਾਸ ਅ ਰੈਂਕਡ ਬੈਲਟ ਸਿਸਟਮ ਐਂਡ ਫਰਸਟ ਆਫ ਆਲ ਆਲ ਦਾ ਫੋਰ ਕੈਂਡੀਡੇਟਸ ਦੇ ਨੇਮ ਵਾਸ देयर ਔਨ ਦਾ ਬੈਲਟ so those who voted the choice was given to them so they could say okay this is my first choice this is my second choice this is my third choice and possibly this could be a fourth choice okay now what happens so first of all it's it's a straight thing so you get points for whoever has voted for you so whoever gets the least amount of points that candidate is eliminated in this case it was ted su so ted su once once ted su got eliminated anybody anybody who voted for ted su so those who had voted okay now let's see uh, whom did they vote for the second position so say for instance out of the, out of the 10 if there were five for boni maybe four for yasser or one for any other candidate that's how they would rank them so after tetsu got then yasser was still in the contest yasser nakwi then yasser nakwi got eliminated so up until the time that you get 50% of the points and this was this happened in in the third ballot had boni got gotten 50% or plus point in the first ballot itself she would have won straight away in the first but that's what she was expecting i still remember when uh, uh, boni she she supported uh, michael ignatieff at that time michael ignatieff was up there and uh, but then what happened gerard kennedy and stephen dion and in the, in the middle, <laughs> middle of the race uh, we saw that that gerard kennedy's camp was going and i i still remember navdeep bass they all were with gerard kennedy and then kennedy camp said okay and it was being broadcasted live here goes kennedy to stephen dion and what happens they made an alliance there and then michael ignatieff got out and stephen dion eventually won in this case also there was an alliance i think they announced on the 9th of november ted su didn't join because i heard him saying that he he didn't want to uh, because there was an abc alliance any anybody but but boni something like that there was an abc alliance that they announced and they said we don't want boni crombie the, the second and the third candidate they did middle alliance ted su said he doesn't want to uh, you know get into the alliance because he doesn't want to uh, vote uh, get his vote against someone but for him that's what he says your take on this one yeah no that's correct actually um, so this time it was a one member one vote right. so the gerard kennedy thing you mentioned those were called delegated convention so each riding elected few delegates who went to the convention then they sort of uh, made alliances and that's very indirect way because the ultimate power should lie with the real voters so that's why this is called a very progressive step they have taken so now each person they have get a ballot and they choose who is their, their second choice or third choice or fourth choice there is no delegate in between who can go to the convention and then make a deal with somebody and join this one or make a bigger deal and go to the other person so it's a very uh, progressive step that way and there is a transparency is nothing done at the last moment the ballots were cast a week ago so that's very progressive one right yeah and, and you're right because this is what i, I was listening that uh, th- this will be a more transparent more democratic that's what they said more democratic more transparent more democratic system where uh, you know uh, the members of course there were only the liberal members would get to vote but they could elect their leader directly less of a deal is that that's what uh, was they meant he's mentioning that uh, you did make some announcement about uh, the zone changing and uh, that wasn't taken in good taste did you mention anything like that that you would change the z- zones of mountain <laughs> <laughs> what was it no what our main mandate is was and will be accountability and transparency so we've not said we will change zones or we wouldn't change zones we said the corruption that was brewing at city hall like you know giving contracts to friends and then closing the mayor was giving contracts to his own friends and then closing the investigations transparency that's what we were getting at and that's what we meant to say so i i'm not sure as to what he's talking about that's what the focus was but there is a good point um, the caller made is uh, i think we lack good debates we need more debates 
uh, that way you can really, uh, the journalists or the panelists, they can approach good questions to the candidates. I think we lack those debates. Uh, we do have the debates on the national level, um, we have at the provincial level, but at the city level we have no debates. So we should uh, That's where the media can play a role. This is 100% true. When we had our elections, I went to every single debate. Some of my candidates that are, um, I think it was Mr. Desange, we never saw him even at one single debate. We never attended anything. Mr. Brown only attended one debate. I went to all of them. It's so important for you and the audience, the community, to know who your leader is and who you're voting for and what can you expect out of their advocacy. And debating is one of the best systems because you see what they're really about when you ask them raw questions. So it's important to have more debates. The public should demand more of these outings and they should actually be there and have an opportunity to ask questions. Yeah, I couldn't more, uh, agree more on the, this point, uh, what both of you just uh, mentioned. And that's precisely the reason I think from the last approximately, I would say 15 to 20 years, we've been holding debates and all our debates are in English because I do also see that sometimes debates are held in Punjabi. So I would ask them, first of all, it's not fair for the candidates who can't speak or understand Punjabi. Secondly, at the city level, municipal and at the federal level, anybody who who cannot speak in English, I mean, how would they go there? So that was one thing that we always did from the last 15 years. Second, uh, regarding our uh, debates uh, for Brampton, yes, we would have expected uh, our current Mayor Brown, but unfortunately he didn't attend. Hopefully, our, our current Mayor Brown will attend uh, the debate that we hold next time. And you're right, we also held debates for candidates from Toronto, and would you believe that, that we had around 19 candidates uh, from Toronto who were standing in different uh, areas, they all showed up at the debates and it was so good to listen to their points. Everyone had their own issues. Uh, just, just on a very quick note, in the interest of time, we're discussing other things, but since you've mentioned that, that was a very grueling schedule for me because they put the debates one after the one after the other. And I would say for good, I would say almost two or three weeks. So I would, or, would host uh, a debate after debate after debate and I hardly had any time to have my lunch among other things that I, I would do. But it was nice, it was a great experience. I had a single mom, very young and she she was diabetic and she, she said it on her hair so, uh, so that's why I'm, I'm quoting her. She said, I'm diabetic, single mom, living in Toronto. What do you expect from me? It's so hard and she, so to get a perspective from her, what, what, how is she facing the challenges of life? There's another person who was an engineer. He had such brilliant ideas, but he openly said it. He says, I just have a budget of maybe four or $5,000. I mean, how, could I, how can I run an election with four or $5,000? But he had amazing ideas. He discussed so many things. Uh, and another uh, candidate that we met, uh, this person would go door to door. And he says, I'm going to cover almost every single house. And he started campaign, campaigning very early, six or seven months. He, he tried to door knock almost sing every single house. He tried to do that, but he wasn't that successful. So we had so many different issues, so many different perspectives uh, when we have all these debates. And I highly recommend, I highly recommend, if I, I'm not, I've never, you know, uh, you know, um, I don't think so I'll ever run for a public office. <laughs> Maybe it's very challenging, it's very difficult. And I have very high respect for anybody who, who does that. But if I were to ever run as a candidate, the first thing I would do is, Tell my campaign manager, put me on media all the time, whether it's a debate or not. Because if, if I have ideas, I'm, I am claiming that I would be changing your lives. I'm claiming that, elect me. And here I am, if I'm not going to the media, what else I'm doing? I mean, I could say I'm, I'm door knocking, I'm busy, conflict of schedules. But I think if I'm getting an opportunity anywhere, free time, free air time, I would definitely make the best possible. And, uh, I'll listen from both of you, but I'll once again say this. Anytime there is an election, please do uh, watch all the debates. And I personally, this is my humble opinion. This is my opinion. I don't want to enforce it on anybody. I would never vote a candidate who doesn't show up at the debates. And we're recommending this thing for India, for Punjab as well. We don't have those debates. Look at England, look at Australia, New Zealand, states. I love watching presidential debates. And this is a system we have in Canada. Let's encourage this uh, democratic process. Please. Yes, actually that's very true and I do have a suggestion. Um, we need the debates and I think it might be better if the media comes together rather than having multiple media uh, channels organizing their own debates. Uh, 
if all of them or some of them come together and we have a debate in a public forum in a community hall and also online because a lot of people who can't come there but they do want to watch and even ask a question and but there are a lot of people who want to come there and they are either not technical savvy and also having a face to face in person debate has its own dynamics uh, people can ask a question they can read the body language of, of the candidate so that's my one question and another call you mentioned somebody uh, sure we should try to seek public office but that's not the only way to do the public service i think we need to take a little bit of small steps we need to work at the community level uh, we need to organize in our own neighborhood uh, you can organize a group to clean your own parks and you can go and make a city council always mississauga i'm sitting on one committee at uh, city of mississauga and we have like 15 minute gap uh, time allocated for the citizen to come and make the representation nobody ever comes so i think that's where the people need to start if you have an idea if you have any issue you need to go and join the city hall at the meeting uh, committee meetings or council meeting and make the presentation that's where you acquire the experience that where you acquire the exposure that where you will build your team so we need to start sort of more at the grassroots level everybody wants to be the prime minister everybody wants to be the cabinet minister but not everybody can be the cabinet minister so there are many many other ways i have been living in the community for 35 years i have been engaged with the community for 35 years at uh, in a sustainability issues in a political issues democracy issues so there is many other forum that where we can uh, do the public service i couldn't agree more you know like on a saturday evening you you could have lot better things to do but here you are uh, devoting your own time volunteering for the community this is a community service that you're doing right now and uh, like nikki ji she's also here i mean once the election is over okay maybe closer to the election <laughs> usually this is what the candidates would do and have we saw all the videos and after that it's all quiet no idea what they are so unless you publicize and you lay charges more people will think that oh it's okay you can go you can destroy the property you can harass people you can make their sleep miserable and the peel police will do nothing so peel police need to really change their game we have a huge influx of newcomers uh, we like for example let's take the simple thing tinted windows it's against the law you can't black and your car windows and if you go in on, on roads in peel region especially in brampton I think I would say 99% of cars have their windows tinted. Peel police have done no no campaign. So I think that peel police is definitely struggling with the auto theft, uh, with the other Kumal uh, petty crimes. And especially, I'm very concerned about these uh, brawls where like there are hundreds of people involved. It happened in Malton. It happened in Brampton. It's not the first time, and uh, I'm afraid it's also not the last. Who will? What's the point of us electing these people that won't even speak on these issues? It's a serious concern and everyone in the community needs to get together and actually do something and have a town hall and not just give us promises and do nothing about them. There is where are these officers? Where are the new mandates? Where are the changes? What are people doing? There is no patrolling at night. These high crime areas, Brampton East, Brampton South, Brampton West, People are going all the time in herds and cars. How come nothing is done? When I was a kid, you would see police cars all around the streets. Where is all of that now? There's more taxes being paid. More people are working. But there is no safety anymore. The news uh, from Y Media Newsroom. Bonnie Crombie has won the Liberal Leadership Race. So yes, we all know, as expected, it's going to be Ford versus Crombie. but we don't have to wait till 2026 we will be discussing so many issues for the next 2 uh, uh, years or so for whatever time is uh, left for the next uh, provincial elections that's happening in 2026 but there are many issues we will keep you posted ford versus crombie uh, what happens and uh, just on a very quick note i'll tell you i was there at, at an event recently and our premier duck ford he he challenged the uh, um, members uh, member provincial parliament he did challenge the brampton mp's i was there i was listening to him there at a very recent event day for yesterday when he challenged uh, why why don't our member parliaments get involved in building highway 413 he 
He did get a response from Member Parliament Kamal Khaira. She is the Cabinet Minister as well. She says, "Don't get us involved. Don't challenge us. You do your part. We will do our part." I also spoke to Ruby Sota. She says, "Yeah, I asked her supporting the healthcare, and she says the Ford government should do their part. Hopefully, uh, we'll bring them together on board here at Y Media, and we'll uh, do the discussion. Here is uh, a glimpse of that event that we had uh, on that day. Though so I was there listening to our Premier Ford, but uh, let's see how it goes." Premier Ford versus uh, Bonnie Crombie.